take it off now. Oh, it's okay. Not me. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning, church. Good morning. We are here, even though it is cold outside. I scraped my windshield with my credit card this morning. I did. I did. Let's stand up and worship Jesus this morning, even though we're cold and chilly. We still worship him. <laughs>
we sang this song last week. So I think you're familiar with it now. It's called I Speak Jesus.
Holy Father, we come before you this morning. God, you are so good and perfect and just and holy. Father, we bring our hearts to you, our minds to you this morning. We praise you. We just want to sit and worship you, Lord. Father, we thank you. And we thank you, Jesus. And we speak that name with boldness because you are Almighty God. And we speak the name of Jesus over ourselves, over these people. Emboldened us to speak your name, Jesus. To be your people, wherever we are. Father, to help us to be obedient without hesitation. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Pray that you are just blessed and honored and exalted today. I ask your blessing on the missionaries that are here this morning. Because that's what they do. They speak Jesus. Father, open our ears to hear your message through them this morning. I praise you and I thank you in Jesus' name. fishing, but has anyone ever gone magnet fishing? Frank has, okay. Um, I don't know if you, you know what that is. Um, you, you take a powerful magnet and you tie a rope or a heavy cable and you throw it in the water and you try and catch a metal object. And I've seen some videos where they've pulled up all kinds of stuff. Um, it's amazing what people throw in the, in the river or water. But uh, one of the videos I saw, they pulled up an old gun uh, from the Civil War. And it was just a block of rust. And I thought, what could they do with that? But over time, they were able to restore this gun. It was amazing. I, I don't know how they could take the screws out of it. Uh, I can't get a screw out of a, something that's five years old. <laughs> But uh, they were able to do it and, and really make it look good. And I've seen videos where they take these old metal toys, probably from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and they can restore them. They can, they can disassemble and paint and um, put decals back on, um, just make them look brand new. Um, it's really amazing. But what's more amazing is what God did for us the great restoration he did for each one of us when he sent his son Jesus to this earth to restore us. Sin had rusted us and warped us and just destroyed us so bad. But Jesus' sacrifice restores us. Um, in Colossians 1, it says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish 
and free from accusation. Jesus did that for us. And we're here to remember that sacrifice. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this plan of salvation that you have for us. For sending your own son, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing yourself, taking our shame and our sins so we can be restored to a right relationship with God. We thank you. And as we partake of these emblems, may we remember this special sacrifice and that you've gone to heaven to prepare a place for us and one day we'll be with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And you have emblems in front of you. If you would open those, we'll partake together. in remembrance of Jesus. And in your bulletin today, you have a faith promise card. And you may be asking, what is faith promise? Um, it is a promise you make to God. It's something very personal. It's between you and God only. And um, we'd like you to take these cards home and pray about it this week. And next week, we would like you to come back and um, Make a promise to God. Actually, mark it down. And this money is used to help missionaries around the world. It doesn't go into the general offering. 100% um, of it is used for mission work. And on it, um, you would mark down an amount and either a weekly, a monthly, or a yearly um, amount. So. Um, and we have some guest speakers today, so, um, but let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for how you take care of us and you supply all our needs. You are an amazing God. And we just thank you for being so wonderful to us. And Father, we want to return a portion to you. And we ask, Lord, that it would be honoring and, and pleasing to you. And may it be used wisely to help people here in the land know about you and people all over the world know about you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob Evers. And as Bob said, we have uh, special missionaries with us today. Our, the missionaries that we support, they are partners with our church. They might not be able to be here often, but we consider them part of the family, part of our church. We are partners together 
as we try to bring people closer to Jesus Christ. And we have two wonderful partners with us today. We have Jessica Dietz from Coastal Choices, which is here in Deland. Uh, it used to be, it's still known as a Grace House Pregnancy Center. And as far as I can remember, we've been supporting that ministry since its inception. So we are proud to be partners with them as they encourage young women and young families, well, women of all ages, to choose life for their, for their unborn children. So we are thankful for that. Jessica is going to speak first in just a few moments. After Jessica speaks, we, uh, we will have Gregory Orenberg speaking. Gregory and Rondi and Anna are missionaries in Vanuatu. If you don't know where Vanuatu is, go check out the map in the foyer, and you can find out exactly where uh, Vanuatu is. If you watch a lot of Survivor, you can find out where a lot of our missionaries live because they're very exotic places. So uh, I've known Gregory for uh, quite a while, I guess about 18, 19 years now, and when I first met him, he had a uh, Baseball Hall of Fame shirt on, so I thought, God can't be all that bad, right? <laughs> so we are very privileged, privileged and pleased to have both of these uh, missionaries supported today. So first, let's uh, give a nice warm welcome to Jessica Deese from Coastal Choices. Two years, really. I just want to say thank you for um, welcoming welcoming me here into your family, and um, being able to be here to represent Coastal Choices, powered by Grace House. Um, so, the last uh, two years, we you know we exited COVID, um, and we started looking at and hearing about the possible reversal of Roe versus Wade. And so we predicted that if the Roe versus Wade was reversed, um, that the abortion community would. Um, send out the chemical abortion warfare online that they would take the fight to the internet and the web to reach women um, so this has happened actually and so we we collaborated and brainstormed and we stood ready um, to serve that community to continue to serve women and so over the last year we have changed our infrastructure to be able to meet women's needs uh, providing life in the gospel, speaking truth and love, sharing options and education, fetal development, medical services within 24 hours. Um, this is a complete pivot from what we were able to offer before, offering it about once a week. The medical services, the counseling was every day. Um, and that's just one of the major huge things that the support of your family has done for our mission. Um, now, as the abortion community has made the, the chemical abortion, the abortion pill, available online right to women's doorsteps, um, we've spent the last year postured and ready on February 20th to launch our telehealth system. So our telehealth system will provide a 24-7 online nurse chat um, to be able to be available to reach women within minutes um, of them searching for an abortion provider online to offer them the, the options of ultrasound and SDI testing, pregnancy tests, of course, all um, free of charge, complimentary because of the support of your family. Um, so with the launch of our mobile medical unit that you likely saw um, at the entrance that we will have open to share um, what your support has done over the last year, we then also will be able to go to and near abortion com um, facilities that are brick and mortar in the community um, to lovingly share the message of life and gospel with women. Um, and of course, the, the, the men, the fathers, and the dads as well. Um, we're fully staffed with a nurse so that we can continue to serve women within 24 hours of making contact with her. <coughs> um, so now with our mobile unit and our launch of our telehealth system, we're there for women to continue to serve her needs and learning about pregnancy, um, speaking life to her, sharing the gospel with her, um, within minutes and we've been able to achieve all of that with your support and with your partnerships I want to thank you for that thank you, thank you. this mic. Maybe I didn't turn it on. <laughs> Try 
that out. That was the case. It is difficult to tell you how thrilled I am to finally be here today. We expected to be here two years ago, but we weren't here because we were behind closed borders in Vanuatu. And then at the beginning of last year, we wanted, again, we wanted to come here, but it, still, we were behind closed borders in Vanuatu. And not just Vanuatu, but Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, they were all closed, and we have to go through one of those places to get from Vanuatu to America, so we just stayed in Vanuatu. But then, uh, about midway through last year, God began removing the barriers one by one, until on December 1st, we arrived back in the United States. And so now we're here. Some of you probably remember years ago when we were trying to start our ministry with Pioneer Bible Translators in Vanuatu, we were locked out of Vanuatu for two whole years. And during that two years that we were locked out of Vanuatu, this church kept supporting our ministry with Pioneer Bible Translators. And for the last two years, when we were locked inside of Vanuatu, <laughs> this church continued to support our ministry with Pioneer Bible Translators. And we love you guys. We love you too. We love you too. Thank you. But that's not all. There's another reason why I'm thrilled to be here today. And that's because this is my first opportunity in more than five years to preach in English. <laughs> I don't preach every Sunday in Vanuatu, but whenever I do preach, it's mostly in Bislama. And I love Bislama but I don't love it as much as my mother tongue. And my mother tongue is English. I love to preach the Christ in English. Except, oh dear, Christ is not an English word. Christ is a loan word from Greek. It's a translation of the word Messiah. Messiah is not an English word either. Messiah is a Hebrew word. And both Messiah and Christ, they mean the same thing. Literally, they mean the anointed one. Somebody took oil and poured it on someone or smeared some grease on them. They put ointment on someone and that person is the anointed one. That's the literal meaning of Christ. But if you study all the messiahs in the Old Testament, you will find out that there were a lot of messiahs and some of them were actually anointed. Some of them were not. Some of them never had any, any grease put on them but they were still messiahs. And so obviously the word came to have a, a figurative meaning as well as the literal meaning. And what you will find if you study all those messiahs, you will find that they were all chosen. And that's what Christ really means. It means the chosen one. Or if you wanna just use one word in English, the best word is chosen. And if that reminds you of a certain webcast series that you've heard about or seen, well, maybe it's because they've done a pretty good job of translation. And so I love to preach about the chosen one. But then that sort of begs the question, who chose him? And the answer, of course, is God chose him. And God is an English word. God chose Jesus. Jesus is not an English word, but that's okay. 
because Jesus is a name, a proper name. And it's good to uh, transliterate proper names, names of people and places. We transliterate them instead of translating them. And here's the reason why. The name Jesus has a meaning. It's a very important meaning. It means Savior. Jesus is our Savior, and that's important. The meaning is important. But when Mary, the mother of Jesus, called out and said, Jesus, it's time to come in for supper. I don't think she was asking him to come save the family from starvation. I doubt if she was even thinking about the meaning of the name. She knew the meaning of the name, but I don't think she was thinking about it when she called out to Jesus. She was thinking about the person that the name was attached to. And even though the meaning is very important, the person is even more important. <coughs> and so that's why we transliterate proper names of people in places like Jesus or Jerusalem. When we transliterate a name, what we do is we take it out of the original language and we change the letters from Greek letters or Hebrew letters, Aramaic letters, Babylonian letters, whatever. We change them out of the original letters and put them into English alphabet letters. Sometimes we change the form so that it will fit into an English grammar so there will be a small change in the form. Maybe we even have to make a little change in the pronunciation so that it follows the English rules of pronunciation. And so we, we make those little changes. But it's still not an English word. It's just a word that we pulled out of the original language and put into English in an English form. And when we do that, the, the sounds come through, but the meaning doesn't come through. And that's okay when we're, when we're transliterating names. But when we transliterate a word like Christ, that's not a name, the meaning doesn't come through. And that can make things confusing. And so, I love to preach about the chosen one. God chose Jesus and then we have to ask chose him for what well if you study the messiahs of the old testament they were chosen some of them were chosen to be priest some of them were chosen to be prophet many of them were chosen to be king probably mostly kings and the Christ of the new testament is all three Jesus is the prophet Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is the king of all of the universe. But I, I think the most prominent of those is king. And so instead of calling him Christ Jesus, we could call him King Jesus. Now that's not a translation. King is not a translation of Christ, but it's a, it's a cultural equivalent for Christ. And sometimes cultural equivalents can make... Uh, things more clear but we have to be careful with court cultural equivalents because uh, we, we need to make sure they're accurate but it, it is accurate to call him King Jesus and so God chose Jesus to be our king he was witnessed by angels and here we go again because angel is not an English word. It's another Greek word that was transliterated into English. The New Testament writers, the apostles, when they wrote the New Testament, they translated the Hebrew word, malach, into the Greek word, angel. And then when the English translators translated from Greek into English, they didn't translate the word that the apostles had already translated out of Hebrew. They just transliterated it 
in English. And when I said angel, I bet you the first thought that came into your mind was not, oh, a messenger. But that's what malak means, and that's what angel means. It means a messenger. And that's the problem with transliteration of words that are not proper names. Because if it's not really an English word, and we really don't know the meaning of the Greek word or the Hebrew word, then we can pour unbiblical ideas and unbiblical meanings into the word. And don't even get me started on demons. That's not <laughs> an English word either. So, God chose Jesus to be our king. He was witnessed by holy messengers, and he was announced by a prophet. And I can't even say a whole sentence without speaking Greek, because prophet is another Greek word. And it does not mean fortune teller. A prophet may or may not predict the future. What a prophet does is a prophet announces something. A prophet is an announcer. And a true prophet announces whatever God wants him to announce. And so God chose Jesus to be our king. He was witnessed by holy messengers. He was announced by an announcer called John the Baptist. And there we go again. Because Baptist and baptize are not English words either. They were transliterated from the Greek word baptizo. And that word, baptizo, led to my finest day as a Bible translator. Our theme for this faith promise is tell everyone everywhere God so loved the world. And my particular ministry is to tell as many people as I can in as many places as I go to tell them in the language that they understand best. That's what I do. And translating words like baptizo is an important part of that. In fact, baptism is so important that it's included in the Great Commission that Jesus gave to us. We have five different versions of the Great Commission in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. And the Great Commission in Matthew and the Great Commission in Mark both include baptism. And the theme verse for this uh, Faith Promise Rally comes from Mark chapter 16, verse 15. That's the version of the Great Commission that appears in the Gospel of Mark. And the verse that comes right after that talks about baptism. And so I'm going to read both of these verses, our theme verse and the verse that comes after it. Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16 from the Living Bible says, And then he told them, You are to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. Those who believe and are baptized will be saved, but those who refuse to believe will be condemned. This is the story of what I consider to be my finest day as a Bible translator. It happened in 2019, 10 years after we started our ministry in Vanuatu. Now, even before we started our ministry in Vanuatu, almost 10 years before we were in Vanuatu, 
there was a group of Sa speaking translators who translated the Gospel of Mark into Sa with the help of a different organization, not Pioneer Bible Translators. And in that translation of the Gospel of Mark, in, in chapter 1, where it tells the story of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus, they translated John the Baptist. And they, they transliterated John, like we normally do in Bible translation. And to their credit, they did not just pull John the Baptist out of their English Bible and put it in their saw translation. They didn't just pull Jean Baptiste out of their French Bible and put it into their translation. And they didn't even pull out of the Bislama Bible John Blanc Baptiste and put it in their translation. They actually translated Baptiste and Baptist. And that was good, except that the word that they chose was not accurate. They translated John Magogoan, which basically means John the Bathman. <laughs> and baptize does not mean to give someone a bath. Well, that uh, translation of the Gospel of Mark has never been published. The organization that helped them to translate that, you know, I, I tried to convince them to publish it, but they never have. And now there is only one member of that original translation team that's still alive and translating, and he is working on the team that we are working with. He's now the senior translator on the SAW translation team that we work with. And all of the other translators on that team are all from the Church of Christ, and they've been taught the meaning of baptize, and so they know. But when they drafted the Gospel of Matthew, the senior translator convinced them to translated the same way that the Gospel of Mark had been translated. They translated Bob Baptize as Morgogo. And one of the other translators came to me privately and expressed dissatisfaction with that translation. He said, we need to change this to Motnu. But I cannot convince the senior translator to, to change it. And so he asked me to convince the senior translator that we needed to change this translation in the Gospel of Matthew. And my opportunity came when we did an accuracy check of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, which has the story of John the Baptist baptizing Jesus. And when that day came, I was ready. Really, I had been preparing for that day most of my life. Since I was a little kid growing up in a Christian church, the elders in that church taught me the meaning of baptize. And they might not have known it, but they were preparing me for a ministry of Bible translation. And by my second year in Vanuatu, I already knew that that translation should be changed to Mwatnu. But when I had only been in Vanuatu for two years, I did not have the credibility to try to change that translation in the Gospel of Mark. So after I had been in Vanuatu, working in Vanuatu for 10 years, I decided that the time was right to try to change that translation in the Gospel of Matthew. And so I started by talking about word formation. 
And I told the translation team, if you throw a rock into the water, it makes a sound. And if you ask a Greek-speaking person what that sound is, the Greek-speaking person will say, oh, it's bumped. That's the sound of something rapidly sinking into a liquid. It's bumped. And what the Greek-speaking people did, they added a verb ending to that sound, and they came up with words like bapto and baptizo. That's how they got the word for something sinking in the water. And after I talked about how the word came to be, I talked about the uh, Greek to English dictionary, which says that baptizo in English means to dip or to immerse. And then I started reading passages of Greek literature outside of the Bible. Not biblical passages, but just other passages of ancient Greek literature that use the word baptizo. Uh, these were passages that have been translated into English, which the translators sort of understand. And, uh, and so I read a bunch of these passages to them. Most of the passages like that that I have read are about ships at sea. The ship is at sea and either a big storm comes up or else the ship is involved in a naval battle and it gets rammed and then the ship sinks. And when the ship sinks, the Greek text says the ship was baptized. <laughs> it goes down in the water and makes a big noise like bat. <laughs> That's one way that the word was used in Greek literature. Another way is when Greek literature was describing uh, the process of dyeing a garment especially to dye it purple, which was a, a really expensive kind of cloth. And when the cloth was dipped into the dye, it was baptized. Funny thing about that, though, is when you dip the cloth in the dye and pull it out, it did not come out washed. It came out stained. <laughs> because baptized does not mean to wash. Baptizo could also be used in a non-literal sense, in a very figurative sense. There's a famous passage written by Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian who wrote in Greek, and he was describing what happened in Jerusalem during the holy days of Passover. And he said that at Passover, Jerusalem was baptized with people. We can do that in English also. We would say that the city was flooded with people or the city was inundated with people. There were so many people it covered the city. They covered the city like a flood covers the land. And baptizo could also be used that way. But it didn't mean to wash the city. And then after I read those passages, then I read from the Bible, from Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. I don't remember what version I used when I read this to the translation team. It was probably NIV. Today I'm using New King James Version, Romans chapter 6. Verses 1 through 14, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together 
in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. The Apostle Paul said that baptism is an awful lot like the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. And that when we are baptized, we are identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so, I read this to the translation team, and then I said, here, let's, let's try something. Let's try translating this uh, a different ways. Uh, just verses three and, uh, 3 and 4. It says, if we change it a little bit, it could say, Or do you not know that as many of us as were washed into Christ Jesus were washed into his death? Therefore, we were, we were buried with him through washing into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Washing into death? It doesn't really make sense. Because baptizo doesn't mean wash. Let's try a different one. How about this? Or do you not know that as many of us as were sprinkled into Christ Jesus were sprinkled into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through sprinkling into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Do you bury people by sprinkling them? I don't really think that makes sense either. Let's try another one. Or do you not know that as many of us as were immersed into Christ Jesus were immersed into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through immersion into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Well, when I actually did this for the translation team, I was substituting saw words in there for baptizo. And what new made perfect sense. <laughs> and then uh, I told them that uh, Greek has different words for wash and sprinkle and immerse. They're different words. If you want to see the words for wash and sprinkle, you can find them in your Greek New Testament in Hebrews 10, 22. They are different words. Baptizo means to immerse or to dip. Now when I finished explaining this, the senior translator had an objection. He said, but the people up in the highlands, they use what new in a different way. And this worried me. 
because those people up in the highlands, those are the heathen people that have not accepted the good news about Jesus Christ. And I want them to understand it. So I want to make sure that we get the right word for those people to hear. And so when he said that, I was worried. And I asked him, well, how do the people up in the highlands use that word? And he said, when the people up in the highlands plant a yam in the ground, they say that they what knew it. And when I heard that, I smiled. And I said, that's perfect. That's a great picture of the burial, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And when I said that, when I said that, uh, the senior translator and one of the other translators, the one that had come to me privately, all of a sudden they started talking back and forth in saw. And they were talking so fast that I couldn't keep up with it. I, I caught part of it, but I, I really didn't follow it. But I could tell that they were very excited, but they were not arguing. So I thought this was probably a good discussion. <laughs> and when they stopped talking and saw, the other translator turned to me and spoke in Bislama, and he said, that's a great picture. Because when you bury a yam, when you plant a yam in the ground, it becomes rotten. But then it springs up with new life. And I said, yes, that's exactly the picture that Jesus used in John chapter 12, except that Jesus talked about a seed of wheat being buried in the ground and dying and then springing up with new life. So Jesus used that picture too. And that's what convinced the senior translator to change our translation to Motnu. It was that picture of the yam that is so much like the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so we changed our translation from Mwagogo to Mwatnu, and uh, John the Baptist became uh, John uh, Mwatnuan. And then a few months later, we changed it again from Mwatnu to Mpatnu, which is a related word related to Mwatnu. Mwatnu means to bury something in the water or in the dirt. Mpatnu means to dip something. And if we use Mpatnu, then we, we avoid some confusion uh, so that people don't think being baptized is like one of those ships that sank and never came up again. <laughs> and so we changed it to Mpatnu. And now... John the Baptist is John the Dipper <laughs> instead of John the Laundryman. <laughs> but I think I lost my mic here. Did I hit the, uh, did I hit a button or something? Okay. That's all right. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I think I need to tell you that the Apostle Paul did not write Romans 6 to convince us of the right way to translate baptizo. <laughs> Nor did he actually write it to tell us how to do baptisms. Because he was writing to people who understood Greek language. They knew what baptizo means. And he didn't have to explain that to them. In fact, he was talking to people who had already been immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus. And the reason he wrote Romans chapter 6 was to convince those people to stop sinning. If you have been immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus, then your old self, your old sinful self, is dead. 
Don't go dig it up. <laughs> That's gross. It stinks. It's rotten. It's awful. Stop sinning. Because if you've been immersed into Jesus Christ, You shouldn't want to do that. You don't have to do that. You are free from sin and death forever. You know, if you plant a yam in the ground, it becomes rotten. But then it springs up with new life. Unless you go dig it up. <laughs> if you dig it up, it stays rotten. And then it's not good for anything. You can't eat it, and it's not going to bring forth a new crop of yams. All you can do is throw it away. You don't want your life to be like that. What if I can't help it? You can help it. The Apostle Paul says that you have the power to live a holy life. Because your old sinful self is dead and you have a new life in Christ Jesus. And there's another application that comes from Romans chapter 6. And it brings us back to our theme for this faith promise. Tell everyone everywhere. And that's what I am doing to the best of my ability right here and right now. And this is how it goes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Jesus died on the cross. To pay the penalty for our sins. He died. He was buried. He rose again. And he lives forever. If you believe that. The appropriate response. Is to be immersed. In the water. As a way of identifying. And connecting with. The death. Burial and resurrection. Of Jesus Christ. If you have never been immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus, what are you waiting for? <laughs> Today is your opportunity. And I invite you to come forward and say, yes, I believe that Jesus is the chosen one, the son of the living God. And yes, I want to be immersed in his name and so I'm going to ask the, the music team to come up and lead us in a song and I think Mark's going to come up here too and uh, if you want to be immersed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ I would invite you to come up here and, and tell us so
Let's pray. Our God and Father, you who loved us so much that you sent your only begotten Son to take our place on the cross. We love you back. And Lord, we know that by your grace, we can live with resurrection power. By your grace, we can overcome the sinfulness of our past. By your grace, we have the power to live holy lives. And Lord, we ask you to fill us so much with the power of your Holy Spirit that we won't want to do those sinful things anymore, that we won't do them. But instead, that we will go out and tell everyone everywhere of your love and of the power of everlasting life that you have given to us. We thank you so much. And we pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus, the Chosen One. Amen. 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 Thank you.